Have you ever felt an instinct that something was different with your newborn, even when doctors couldn't pinpoint it? In this vulnerable episode, Allie shares her journey navigating her son Leo's rare diagnosis and the ways it impacted her mental health. She asks the powerful question, when you face challenges as a new mom that others may not understand, how do you move through the isolation to find support? Allie's story provides insight into trusting your intuition as a mother, finding community when you need it most, and learning to care for yourself amidst hardship. Tune in to hear how Allie found light even through life's curveballs. Hey there, incredible listeners. Before we dive into Allie's story, I want to take a moment to talk about something really special. Ergo baby. Motherhood isn't just about the baby. It's about you, the woman bringing life into this world. And when you're doing something that important, a lot of it comes down to feeling confident about being a good mom. And that's where Ergo Baby steps in. Instead of creating things to add a long list of baby things, Ergo Baby makes products for the mothers who are using them. The sensation of holding a newborn baby for the first time, bundling baby up into their crib for the night ahead, that first visit to the in-laws. With Ergo Baby, it's not just about functionality. Using their products make you feel like the amazing, caring mom you are. From baby carriers to high chairs, each Ergo Baby product is designed to embrace your nurturing side and enhance your motherhood journey. What I love most about Ergo Baby is their products are more than just items. They're a reminder that you're doing an incredible job. So to all the women out there listening, if you're looking for products that resonate with your nurturing spirit, check out Ergo Baby because motherhood is about you too. All right, let's dive into today's story. Get ready to be inspired, empowered, and reminded that you're never alone in this journey. The Golden Hour Birth Podcast, a podcast about real birth stories and creating connections through our shared experiences. Childbirth isn't just about the child. It's about the person who gave birth, their lives, their wisdom, and their empowerment. We're Liz and Natalie, the Golden Hour Birth Podcast, and we're here to laugh with you, cry with you, and hold space for you. Welcome to the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. I am your co-host, Liz. And I'm your co-host, Natalie. And tonight we have Allie on from St. Louis. Um, a lot of St. Louis people, and they know her, survive and thrive, Mama. Thank you for coming on tonight, Allie. I'm so glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So if you want to go ahead and tell us a little bit about you and your family. Yeah, sure. Um Yes, my name is Allie, and I am from St. Louis originally. Um, I was born and raised here. I I ended up going to Mizzou um, for school. Yes, (laughs) go Mizzou. And um, met my husband there. Um, We actually were friends throughout college and um, got together our senior year. And um, afterwards, he um, he was born and raised in Columbia, so he decided to stay there. It was 2008, y'all, so I'm a little bit older. Um, I moved back home with my parents. It was during like this major recession. And then mm-hmm. he moved home with his parents. Um, I got my dream job at the St. Louis Zoo. It was like Aww. unbelievable. I was so, so, so excited to work at the zoo. Um, but, you know, I was missing Kyle. And eventually, I'm trying to think how many years it was, but it was maybe two years of long distance. Um, and he finally came um, to live in St. Louis, which was wonderful. And we bought a home and we like lived like the um, quintessential like um, life of after college sweethearts. Mm -hmm. Um, And we um, decided after many years of traveling and having fun that we were ready to start a family. So um, along came my three children who we'll be talking about tonight um, Olivia, who is now seven. And we were just joking that it's like almost a decade ago. So it's like racking my brain for these details. But um, Olivia, who's seven, Leo, who's five, and Kennedy, who's almost three. And it's my baby. And I'm like, how, yeah. you know, how do I have a three-year-old um, who is who's my baby? So um, anyways, so going back, so that's kind of who I am. Um, but post-baby or pre-baby, my pre-baby life, Kyle and I are a little bit older. So like at this point, we're like 28, 29, and we're ready to start a family. So we were traveling a lot internationally, and we had gone on this amazing trip to Italy, Austria, and we're like, 
we're going to start trying like right now. And um, tried and didn't get pregnant and came home. And like, you know, when you first start trying, you're like, oh, you know, this is going to happen pretty easily. And um, it just didn't at first, you know. Um, And finally, a couple months later, I did get pregnant. And um, I don't even know. Do you want me to go into that pregnancy or do you want me to talk a little bit about anything else? Yeah. What was before I move on? Like with Olivia. Yeah. So Olivia was, um, I got pregnant with her and I just remember being like so wrapped up in every detail. I wanted to know like literally every day how she was growing, like what was happening. I was reading every single piece of literature I could get my hands on. Like I just wanted to know everything about my growing body, but also what was happening with her. And so, um, the birth, or the pregnancy though was pretty um, typical, I would say. Like there were no major issues. Like I just was getting big fast and I was like, oh my gosh. Like by the end of the pregnancy, I was like, I'm done being pregnant. You know what I mean? Like, um, yeah. And she cooked all the way through. So my birthday is April 25th. I had my 40 week um, appointment on the um, 26th. And I remember going on in and being like, all right, like if she's not coming soon, like we're going to have issues. <laughs> like I was just so ready to have her. And they did an ultrasound and um, they were like, your fluids are low and we're going to have to induce you like today. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> like this is like the best case scenario. I mean, I was huge. Um, and we were just ready to have a baby, you know, like yeah. both of us we're very, very ready. Um, and so let's hop into her birth story because I, I have a lot to tell you all. Um, so I might as well just start with Olivia. Um, I went in to be induced. Well, first they told me we were going to go get induced and we were like, all right, let's go home. Let's go get crazy bowls and wraps. It was like, (gasps) we need to make sure to eat. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We need to eat right now. (laughs) And I was like, I want to make sure that I'm fed and like, we're all good. And like, for some reason, like when it happens like that, you go to the doctor and then they're like, it's today. All of a sudden you're like, wait, yeah. do I have everything I need? <laughs> like I was second guessing everything. So I felt like I completely repacked. Um, you know, we we got our dog taken care of, um, but we got back to the hospital. And I think that my expectations, you know, I had read so much. Like and for Olivia, like I went and actually did birth classes in the hospital before I gave birth. Um, I knew that I wanted an epidural. I had like a a birth plan in place, um, but I knew that it was fluid. In my brain, I was like, I trust my doctor. Like, I'm just going to like kind of let this go the way it's going to go um, and we'll see what happens. Um, so I felt like pretty prepared in my head going into it. Um, but it's safe to say, like, um, I don't think that anything you read, you know, adequately prepares you for like what really, how it really goes down. Um, And I think that the biggest surprise is that, you know, it's never going to go 100% to plan. And I didn't know that for this birth. So knowing that for my other births helped a lot. But I came in thinking, I go in, I get my epidural, the baby comes out, like we're all good, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's just like how you imagine it. Yeah. So we go in, Um, I check in, they get me into a room, they get me in a a gown and they're like, there's this huge storm rolling in. Everybody has to go into the hallway. (laughs) And like, I had just gotten like down on, I wasn't in active labor, but I'm like listening to these women (laughs) giving birth in the hall. Oh my God. (laughs) Oh my God. It was wild. It was wild. I have a picture of what the sky looks like. I mean, it was green, ominous, like it was April. So, you know, it was probably a tornado, you know, but like it. Yeah. Anyway, so that's when I started to get nervous because I'm hearing these women giving birth. I'm like, oh, this is real now. OK, let's go. <laughs> um, so we get into the room and they're like, all right, storms pass. Let's get you hooked up. Um, let's get you on Pitocin, you know, so that we can get this going. And I'm like, cool. Pitocin, I'll take it. Pitocin is supposed to strengthen your contractions. Well, um, you know, it takes hours to do so because they are slowly increasing the amount of Pitocin that you're getting. Um, And they give me this ball to bounce on. 
And so I'm like sitting there bouncing and there's hours that go by and I'm at like a level six, you know, and, and they're like, are you feeling anything yet? And I'm like, I'm feeling nothing. There's no pain. There's no extra contraction. Absolutely nothing. They're like, oh, that's a little bit weird. Like, let's just keep upping it. And I made it to a 10 before, which is one of the highest levels they can get to with Pitocin. And they were like, we don't see this very often, but your your cells likely aren't binding to the Pitocin. And so you, it just literally does not work. And so it was doing nothing for me, so, which was a little scary wow. because I was like, I just went through all of that. Yeah. Like what happens now? Like I'm yeah. still at two centimeters, you know, what happens? And they're like, well, we're just, just going to hope that um, it's still priming your body somehow. And we're going to give you the epidural and break your water and just see what happens. So I was like, okay. But in the back of my mind, I'm thinking if she doesn't drop enough, you know, and if my body isn't really working, um, this induction isn't going to work and I'm going to go into a C-section. Like, I, you know, I started like thinking that already. Um, and this was already late at night. So I had checked in around one-ish and this was like probably it had to have been like 11 o'clock because 10 hours later. Mm -hmm. So, um, they, um, decided, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do all these things. They put the catheter in, they, um, broke my water, you know, epidural in all of those things. Let me just tell you, all of those things were fine. You know, what wasn't fine. I miss this. That thing that they, the, the line that they put in your hand. Oh, does anyone talk about this? On oh this podcast? yeah. 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 I'm literally the worst part. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It took uh, my, yeah. like, my first one, like, probably six, seven tries with, like, four different people. Oh, my God. Yeah. It's the worst. Yeah. I was so scared about the epidural. I didn't want it in my back. I just was scared that something bad was going to happen. That was nothing. The epidural <laughs> was nothing compared to the light. Anyways, just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah. So so I'm all hooked up and um, Kyle's like sleeping in the corner. Um, this might have been the easiest night of his whole life. Um, I, <laughs> I was like, how can this man be just sleeping here? We're about to have a baby, but no, not unaffected. <laughs> um, but um, so so I'm laying there. I'm just watching the monitors. I felt like I just looked up and, and was watching the monitors all night long. Um, and finally... Uh, they would check me periodically, but not much. Um, but by like 6 a.m., they're like, all right, you are at 10 centimeters. So breaking my water helped all of that progress. So oh, I was really happy about that. Um, and they were like, but we want you to labor down a bit, meaning that they wanted her to come down in the birth canal even more. Um, I personally think they were just wanting a shift change. <laughs> so, the, the, so the nurses uh, change at like 7 a.m. or something, maybe 7 or 8. And I'm pretty sure they were just like, didn't want me to start pushing with one nurse and then have to get another one. Um, also, like my doctor, I knew she was not going to be in that weekend. It was another doctor in the practice and God bless her. Um, I was like waiting. I was, you know, it's your first baby. I was like, let's go. And um, they were like, yeah, we just called her and she was in line at McDonald's getting a Sprite and then they got, gave her the wrong order. So she had to go in and I was like, what in the world is happening? Like, get her here, you know? Oh right. They it's, probably it's didn't even need story. to go in that much detail. Uh, <laughs> no. You're not going to her in a few minutes. She's on her way. Oh my God. I'm, I'm like, get her here. Get her here. Okay. Thank you. And bring so she comes. Yeah. She comes with her sprite. With her sprite. <laughs> she's like, I'm I'm here. And you know, God bless her because this all ended up working out because of her. But she, you know, they were like, take a couple practice pushes. So I'm pushing. Um, I also was not prepared for pushing in general. Um, pushed. And she, every time I push, they're like, oh, we see her, we see her. And then she would come back up and push again. And they're like, there she is. And then right back up again. And I was like, okay, this is going to be okay. Cause they can see her, you know, she's, she's going to come down. Um, and I pushed for two hours straight. And, um, when I say like two hours straight and people like then it's a long time to be pushing without breaks. And and I don't think that people realize what that's like until you're actually in it. Mm -hmm. um, I was 
uh, throwing up. They put me on oxygen. I uh, eventually I was like, this is not working. Like, I don't know how much longer I can do this. Um, so the doctor came back and she was like, there's something I want you to try. Um, and if it doesn't work, we're going to we're going to call it and we're going to do a C-section. And like, oh, you know, from the beginning of this yeah. entire thing, I don't know why in my brain I was like, I'm going to have a C-section. And uh, quite honestly, to me at this point in my life, any way the baby comes is how the baby comes. Mm -hmm. I'm like, there's nothing. But when when you're like expecting to have a vaginal birth or things to go, you're like, your brain is just in a million places. Mm -hmm. um, I, I Yeah, I just wasn't prepared. So anyways, she said, I want you to take a towel and I want Kyle to take the other end of the towel and I want you to pull on it like you're playing tug of war. And I was like, I can do that. And Kyle <laughs> was like, I can do that. And I was like, and Kyle is a strong man. He's a big man. I was pulling so hard and he was like falling towards me. Um, and, and after probably, I'm guessing like 20, 30 minutes, we got that baby out. She came That's out. such a good idea. And it was like, I, I could not believe it. But I tell every mom, first time mom, before they go into their labor, if it's not working, and you just want one last stitch effort, try the towel trick. Because there's something about the way you bear yeah. down while pulling that mm. is really yeah. helpful. Yeah. And and I think and, that when you yeah. decide to get an epidural, there's only so much you can do in terms of positioning, yeah. right? Yeah. So so that was a game changer for us. Um, and And when she was born, I mean, like, oh, my God, it was like the heavens opened up and a light was like coming and you talk about like this is called the golden hour and there is just something oh that is just so precious and amazing about that moment um and yeah having her earth side was was beautiful and it was like you know everything that you were scared of everything that was uncomfortable dissipates yeah. um there is one part of the story that i forgot and it was the epidural um button um I was scared of feeling labor and birth. Um, and so they're like, just press this button anytime you feel like you might need more. <laughs> and I pushed it probably, it was too many times. I can't tell you how many times I pressed the button. But after you give birth, they tell you, hey, you have to get up and go to the bathroom um, just to like make sure everything's working and like we're moving again. And I could not, I literally could not get up. And they were like, you have to, like, you, we can't let you out of this room until you go pee. And I was like, I literally can't stand up. And they had to put the catheter back in me, which at that point, everything was kind of wearing off. But like, how awful. Like, I was like, uh -huh. it was not fun. Yeah. Um, another piece of advice is just to to hold off on the button just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit, like because because you do eventually have to get up, and and I and I learned that um, I learned that the hard way, and and changed it for my other births. But the um, weirdest feeling though is getting up after birth. The it's so weird, and it and I don't know if peeing is hard for anyone else or just me, or is it like you know there's tons of people in your room, and all of a sudden they're like, "Well, pee," and I'm like, "I don't," but I don't know if I don't know. <laughs> Anyways, it's weird. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so fun. And you also like, you know, all of a sudden you're like, all these people just saw saw this amazing thing happen. Like, wow. Um, yeah, for being a first time mom is a trip. Uh, third time mom, I'm like, my leg first spread. I was like, everybody come in my room, watch this baby move forward. But the first, you know, it's scary. Yeah. Um, so so postpartum with with um, Olivia. Um, she was jaundiced. So we actually stayed in the hospital a little bit longer than we would have typically. Um, she had jaundice. Um, we stayed in the pediatric unit. Um, but when she got home, things kind of started to level out and everything was okay. Um, I was running on just straight up high adrenaline. I felt like I could do anything at first. I really, really did. And there was something about um, that gave me so much pleasure and pride being able to do it. Um, and that probably lasted longer, um, than, than I thought it maybe would. Um, actually I had no idea, but like now that I talk about it, 
like months, I kept up this facade that like it was good. And like, I don't think I realized how not good I was until after I had my second, you know, and I don't know if that makes sense to you at all. But like, um, it just, I just felt like, you know, I don't know, this is, this is my job. I can do it, you know, like grin and bear it, like all of this stuff, but like then repress feelings, you know, of like, um, you know, not really ever processing that birth. Nobody, you know, because it was semi-smooth and she got here and she was healthy. Um, you know, nobody really asked about it after that. But as a first time mom, there's something about talking about your story that's healing, just letting it out. There were scary moments in probably every birth or moments where it kind of like builds up that trauma. And so like I I had really never shared that story um, before I did on my own page, which is so wild. Um, and why I love this podcast so much is because I think that it is such a healing journey for moms um, to tell their stories. Um, and then so helpful to other moms to hear it, to be like, I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. So, um, what happened with Olivia is okay. So life went on. I never found myself getting mad at, um, well, at the time, at the time postpartum, like, um, let's just say like, uh, postpartum depression or postpartum anxiety, like there was still a little bit a decade ago of a stigma surrounding that. Mm -hmm. And so like people really didn't talk about it if they were feeling anxious or depressed. Yeah. Um, and I wouldn't have said that I was anxious and depressed before I had babies. You know what I mean? Like that it wasn't really something that I was aware of. Um, but I slowly could feel I was never mad at my babies. I was really mad at my husband. I the resentment built up and started bu building up hard. Mm -hmm. And um, with Olivia, I just felt like um, eventually, like, I was like, I'm so strong. I can do this. But then I, I was like, this isn't fair. <laughs> I just had to go through all of that, you know, being pregnant, so uncomfortable. Like, it's a lot. And then have the baby, which is so hard to actually physically have the baby. And then like right after like I'm at home doing every seemingly everything it felt like everything mm -hmm. and I was like what in the world is this like this does not seem right <laughs> and like but but you know I I it was just like one of those things you get through I guess right yeah mm -hmm. um and and I'll tell you I did not have the same mindset with Leo you know okay so so we're moving on to Leo okay so Livy was 18 months when I got pregnant with Leo. Um, and we were trying. So I was like, if we're going to do this, we're going to whip him out, right? And <laughs> we're just going to go. We're going to rip off this band-aid. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> and, and I got pregnant and we were so happy. Um, but there was this lingering anxiety with Leo's pregnancy that um, I did not have with Olivia. And I felt it during pregnancy. And I don't know if it's because I had a toddler at home at the time. Um, I was managing that and my own pregnancy. Um, it, it just, it was, it felt different. Mm -hmm. It felt different than the first pregnancy where I was feeling so happy and into everything, you know? And I was just, Something was separating me from this pregnancy, and I did not know what. And um, I had gestational diabetes with Leo, and I was diagnosed with that, and that came as somewhat of a surprise. And I was managing it through diet, and um, for me, that was extremely stressful because when I am pregnant, I was like, the best part about being pregnant is eating all the things. Mm -hmm. I was so... I love being pregnant, feeling like, you know, it, not that it doesn't matter. It does. But like, I, it just was exciting to have a Rice Krispie treat once in a while, right? <laughs> and and when you have gestational diabetes, they're like, you can have that, but you also have like have five pieces of cheese with it, you know? So it's just, it was a lot of learning, but it was, um, I, I don't know if that like felt like it sucked the joy out of pregnancy for me or like some, you know, and I that sounds so dumb. But like, I just, there was something that felt so, so weird. But also like at the same time, 
I remember telling my husband, there's something keeping me from like wanting, not wanting this pregnancy, but like being connected to it. And I could not figure out why. And it was like, I don't know if my body or the universe or God is like not allowing me to get close to this baby because something bad is going to happen. And so the anxiety turned into intrusive thoughts, you know, and that um, it wasn't, it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun. Um, and I feel awful about that. Um, the week before I went into labor with Leo, uh, we moved homes. Um, so we were going through a lot of changes at one, um, which also can perpetuate some, some anxiety. And I remember I was 39 weeks pregnant and I woke up probably around midnight, um, as most pregnant people do, to go pee. And I was like, oh, I'm feeling like really uncomfortable. Like I really can't get back to sleep. I'm going to go get in the bath. And got in the bath and my contractions, which really started off as like just feeling like normal period cramps, just kept getting stronger and stronger. Um, and I was like, I had never gone into labor before. Um, with Olivia, I was induced. So this was all brand new to me, but it was also like really exciting. So like I, and I'm like kind of like a spiritual person. So I turned, I had made like a baby K um, playlist. So I'm there with my candles and my playlist and listening to music and kind of timing what was going on. And they were, they were pretty strong. And I was like, I cannot believe that this is really happening. And, and it was. <laughs> so got back into bed, told my husband. He was still sleeping, of course. <laughs> God bless Kyle. Oh, I was talking shit on Kyle. So he, um, he was like, you think it's really happening? Like, I, I do. I do think it's happening. So I called the nurse line in the morning. They're like, maybe. Oh, I forgot to tell you guys this part. A week before that, I didn't feel the baby move. Um, and it was freaking me out. And so I had gone in for a stress test the week before. Okay. So they had already kind of like seen me and heard from me the week before. So I called them. They were like, maybe, maybe not. You know, if your water hasn't broken, like you can go in and be checked, but just expect that they might send you home. And I was like, okay, fine. So I felt like it was pretty strong. I felt like the contractions were, were getting more and more intense. Um, I had taken a shower and I was like standing there and I like, it was taking my breath away. Um, so we get to the hospital and there's somebody right in front of me and she's checking in. And then like, it's like moving like slow as molasses. I swear. I was like, this is like, (laughs) of course this is happening to me. They're like, you're good. Like, don't worry about it. I'm like, okay. (laughs) So, so I get checked in, they put me in a room. She must, they only have one nurse on um, she's the one checking all the women and she comes in with her gloves on. She's like, I, I probably got to tell you to go home. I just told the lady before you to go home. And I was like, okay, fine, whatever. I swear she was nurse, nurse ratchet. And she said, <laughs> she said, suck her fingers and up there. She's like, oh yeah. She's like, you're four and a half centimeters and you're your bag is like bursting or something. What she said was like, so uh, uh, my mind was just blown. She's like, I don't know how your water hasn't broken. It's just bursting. I was like, okay, so uh, you're (laughs) keeping me. And she's like, yeah, I'm keeping you. I'm like, okay, thank God. So they bring me to a room and I'm telling you girls, it was a night and day experience from Olivia's birth. Night and day. Um, and it was just so incredibly peaceful and so incredibly smooth. So like I get to the room, like I'm already going to get an epidural. I know this because, but no, no Pitocin need, needed. We were already there. Mm-hmm. Put the epidural in. Uh, it was a holiday weekend. Nobody was there. I had this amazing nurse. Um, and we just like, I swear they gave me a peanut bowl. Or they went to break my water. It broke on its own. They gave me a peanut ball, which I had never used before. Oh, um, God bless peanut balls. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Why didn't we invent that? Like, uh, it is the best invention ever. ever. Um, so I'm laying there. And the last thing she had said to me, she was like, if you feel anything uncomfortable, just let me know. You know, just press the nurse's button. And when I was like, we're going to be here for a few hours, you know. So I roll over and I'm like about to fall asleep. And... All of a sudden, I'm like, I feel this urge to poop. And I'm like, whoa, like that is a weird feeling, you know? And I told Kyle and he's like, 
like, what are you doing in the middle of the day? He's like sleeping in the corner again. He's like, if you got to poop, if, if you got to poop, you should poop. And I'm like, Kyle, no. <laughs> I was like, no, no. Can you go get a doctor or a nurse? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yeah, you think I'm just gonna shit on the bed right now? Like, this is awful. <laughs> so, so he goes outside. He's like, I don't even know what to say. I'm like, just say I don't feel right. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> she had a poop. <laughs> Thanks, yeah, you guys. I love my husband. He's just funny. So, so, so. He, a nurse comes in and she checks me. And this is an hour after the epidural and the peanut ball. Okay. This is fast. And she was like, Ellie, you are at a 10. Like, we're going to have a baby here soon. And it was just so quiet. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I feel like Olivia's, it was like so stressful. And it just felt so different. This just felt so good. So my doctor drove in. It was a holiday weekend. God bless her. Um, best freaking LB on the block. Um, yeah. she came in, drove in, and surprised me. Um, Aww. and she delivered Leo. And um, I and then my mom came in. Um, she came and sat in the chair next to me, and I pushed for five minutes, and he came out, Aww. and it was <laughs> beautiful. Aww. And um, it was also like the heavens. <laughs> opened up and like you know that feeling when the baby comes out of you and it's just like the pressure is released oh my you God. just Ugh. feel the intense like this just feels so good i like, would like the love best feeling to in the like world. see a woman's brain when she gives birth or any person's brain when they give birth yeah. and like all the endorphins and oxytocin that's just like firing mm -hmm. it's like the best feeling it would be it would be the most beautiful brain scan ever yeah. because you know that feeling it just is it's like heaven yeah. and um but like right away you know they hold Leo up and they're like here he is and i just remember looking at him and i was like something's wrong something's different like and i and i hate to use the word wrong because i i don't want number one, anyone to ever think that if their baby is different, that there's something wrong. But like, as a mother, that's just like what my brain was telling me, like, there's something going on. And I said, I, I birthed, um, or I um, videoed all my births. And I said in the video, his mouth is so big. And, um, and I don't think I knew what that meant at the time, you know, um, so we do skin to skin. It's so great. But like I'm sitting there like just examining him like I can't and I I don't even know how to explain it. There's just like this moment where your brain like is just trying to figure it out, you know, and everyone around me seemed to be completely oblivious to this. All right. So like they're more worried about my gestational diabetes that they're going to test his blood, make sure that he's okay, that I'm okay. So there's a lot going on, you know, kind of in the room. Um, but nobody's really thinking about that. Um, we kind of get him cleaned off. And I look at Kyle and my mom and I'm like, do you see anything that's different with him? And they're like, no, no, not, no, he looks like a baby. And I'm like, okay, you know, this must be me, you know? And um, so we kind of just go through like, all the the routine you know you have skin to skin they do all the, the stuff they check them out and then they put them back and they're like he's healthy you know he's breathing fine and you know all of he was pink and um he's great um and the next it was probably i think it was that day i had voice concerns to my nurse saying you know I think there's something different about him. And she was like, I trust you. Like, we're going to talk to the pediatrician um, who's here and we'll start to like try to get answers for you. And so the house pediatrician came to see us and he was like, I do see what you're saying. His mouth does seem a little big and his tongue seems a little bit big. 
Um, but it's nothing I've ever seen before. And like those words really got me because I was like, you're the house pediatrician here at one of the biggest hospitals in St. Louis. And you have never, ever seen anybody who's looked like him. I was like, how is that possible? You know what I mean? Like all I wanted was an answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, And um, we had my OB, we had midwives, we, everybody who came in the room, I asked them, I was like, have you seen this? And they're like, we have not. We, and, and it just, and I was like, okay. I was like, none of the medical books, like what, I, I don't know how nobody has an answer for me, but that's fine. Um, but otherwise he was healthy. So he was breathing. Okay. And he was nursing, which was amazing. Um, and so we just like really kind of put a pin in it for that moment. Um, because there was nobody with an answer. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, when we got to our own pediatrician, he suggested that we go see St. Louis children's genetics, um, to kind of start ruling out any genetic disorders. Mm -hmm. Um, but he was kind of saying that he thought that it might be something called Beckwith-Wiedemann syndrome, which I had never heard of in my entire life. Um, I had never heard of anybody with that. Um, it did not run in my family. Um, and it just was one of those things that I was like, what does that mean? You know what I mean? Yeah. For Leo um, and for his future. And um, we ended up getting a clinical diagnosis from the St. Louis Children's Hospital um, team um, with beckwith Ludeman syndrome. They were spot on. And basically what that is, it is a genetic disorder um, that affects the 11th chromosome. And it is not, um, it can be, uh, passed down through parents, but it was not in our case. It is a complete blip. Um, and what it is, is it is an overgrowth syndrome. So if you've ever seen on like Guinness Book of World Records where they have like maybe a child or a baby with like a really big tongue, like they're born like with it sticking out, um, that is like one of the clearest markers of beckwith Wiedemann syndrome. Now, there's like a physical part of Beckwith, but there's also this like really scary part of it, which is one in 10 children with this syndrome develop childhood cancer. So that was like the, the biggest part of it because yeah. to me, I, we were seeing pediatric dentists and we went to ENTs and we're like, what can we do about the physical tongue? So, so let me just, I, I'm gonna go back just a second. His, what was it was with him, what made him so different is that not all Beckwith is the same. They call it a mosaic syndrome. So they come out and they can look different. Everybody looks a little bit different. And for him, what it meant was that he had hemihypertrophy of the tongue, which means one side was very small. Like everybody has a line down the center of their tongue. Mm -hmm. One side was really small and one side was really, really big. Um, it also affected his jaw right here. So like it almost looks like he like has a thin side of his cheek and then like a really almost like there's like nuts in his cheek on the other side. Um, and so they basically um, di diagnosed him with that. And I was like, well, okay, so let's go on with the cancer part because one in 10 doesn't sound so bad when it's like one in 10 kids have like um, colic, you know, but like when they say like one in 10 kids have can have cancer, yeah. like that just like changes things for you, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and, and just like before I go into his treatment and stuff and, and all the things that I did to like make this better in my brain, um, this I think was sending my anxiety, uh, into a spiral. Mm -hmm. I was consumed by this and what it meant for him. And then like, I went from being almost like not sure, you know, during my pregnancy feeling like I couldn't connect to it mm -hmm. to being like overly connected. Like mm -hmm. I have got to help my baby. I have got to advocate for my baby. I have got to be his voice. Like it felt so heavy that I had to find this answer and that he needed to get the help that he needed. Um, and, and that was my mission. Mm -hmm. It was just my mission, but that didn't make so that was like all part of what was happening. But I also had just had a baby, you know, so like dealing with postpartum, but that all feels like a blur now because I was so focused yeah. mm -hmm. on, on just this diagnosis and how to 
to be okay yeah. um, with that. And the first thing I did, and I will say this to anyone who has something like this happen, either whether you find out that there is an abnormality um, during pregnancy or you don't find out until after the baby's born, um, find a support group of people who are um, have the same diagnosis or do some re- research and you can find it anywhere. I went on Facebook and I just like threw in there Beckwith Wiedemann's support and found an amazing support group with people all over the world. And all of a sudden I was seeing pictures of little babies that looked exactly like Leo. And I was like, that's what I needed. And I made a friend who I talked to to this day. Our little boys were born two weeks apart and just like oh. going through this process together of blood draws and ultrasounds and all of these visits and figuring out, you know, how we go about this and having people to talk to about it. Yeah. It changes your whole experience. So I always um, like to bring that up. Like if they're because you're going to get a surprise here or there. You know what I mean? Like there's nothing's perfect. Nothing's perfect in pregnancy, nothing's perfect in postpartum and with your child. So like at some point along the line, you might need a support group. And so that's why I always just say like, go find one wherever it is. Anyway, so the the good part about this story is that the childhood cancer risk like diminishes at like age five. It's I mean, it doesn't diminish. It's much lower. And then by age 10, it's gone. So, like, that's amazing. Yeah. And in terms of physical stuff, like, he's going to need um, a jaw surgery when he's 16. You know what I mean? Like, we're, like, so grateful that, um, you know, it is not going to affect the rest of his life. You know what I mean? Which yeah. I think at first that's what we believed to be true. Mm-hmm. That's yeah. what we believed would happen. Um, and so it, there's just, you know— um, when I say like, I believed that things would like always go perfectly. And it's like, um, things, things go the way they're going to go. And you, you kind of just walk that path with it. And when you, um, advocate for your baby and then you love your baby, no matter what, like you're gonna, you're gonna end up being okay, you know? Um, but it took a while to get there. And after Leo, for me personally, um, I, I was fine for a little bit. And like, you know, with Olivia, I had this adrenaline and I was good and I was super mom and I could shower and I made it look really great from the outside looking in. Um, with Leo, I, I, um, basically snapped, you know, there was a point where I was like, I'm not okay, you know? Um, and having a two-year-old and then a baby that needed extra attention and um, being scared that like he wouldn't be breathing, you know, because his tongue would go back in his mouth, you know, just like all of that. Um, Again, never with my babies, always with my husband. I took it out on him and I took it out so hard. And I'll never forget, um, I had a friend who I was talking to and I was just like, I just like, I feel really bad. You know what I mean? Like, this is just like not, not going well. And she was like, have you ever thought about being medicated? And I was like, no. And she was like, you know, talk to a therapist or talk to someone and just see what your options are because you're suffering. Like you're really, really suffering. And at that point, like I, I, nobody still was like talking about being on medication, but she was like, I'm on medication and it has changed my life. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it was the one friend I needed to say something to me. You know what I mean? Like when you have someone you love and you trust tell you something like that, all of a sudden you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm going to do that too. And like it changed my entire life and it is like the best thing that ever happened to me. And I wish that I would have had that uh, friendship and like that advice earlier because I think I could have enjoyed um a lot more of number one Olivia being little and like that experience and then Leo, but, but I got medicated. I really did. So after probably like ooh, three months, um, I, I was medicated and it was like, it was night and day of a postpartum experience and, and a having baby experience. And, um, 
it, and not, not to say that it's not hard. It's still very, very mm-hmm, hard. Mm-hmm. Um, but it it kind of just like takes that edge off of the, and for me, it, it was just like really bad anxiety. Mm-hmm. And waking up every day with a knot in your stomach should not, in my opinion, is not how to live your life. And and so, um, yeah, I told you I had a lot to say about <laughs> levies and Leos and how it's kind of connected and um, the inner workings of all that. And I don't even know, do we have time to talk about Kennedy? This is why I'm like, I have a lot, a lot going on. Yeah. Yeah. We're good. <laughs> I'll tell you because Kennedy's, Kennedy's is short. So we're, we made it to a good point. Okay. We got through Leo's diagnosis. We had, we're going to normal doctor's appointments. Everything was like good. You know, we were smoother, smoother sailing. I had a then now four-year-old, two-year-old. No, no. Three-year-old, almost two-year-old. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know if I want any more children. Um, After that experience, it felt like we were done. Um, No one really talks about how tough having babies. Well, actually, some people do. Uh, Having babies are on relationships. I just feel like that is not an uh, open book yet. Um, we're trying to break that stigma of like that everything is perfect at home. You know, no. it's all good. Yeah. Um, our marriage was feeling rocky, you know, and I was like, I don't think I can go through this again. And at that point, we were in California and we were spending some time out there. And I remember my friend um, came to visit me and I told her on the beach, no more babies. This like illness is coming from China. Like we don't know what that is. And I'm struggling, you know, yeah. we're so happy. Like these kids are great. Like I'll just be done. And she was like, I think that's a good idea. You know, like you should embrace that. And I'm like, I, I think I will. And it was like sad, but also like feeling good at the same time. Like I always wanted three or four kids. So it was kind of just like, all right, if I'm going to put a pin in this, like, that's okay. Um, and COVID, uh, happened. This was March of, or February, March, 2020. And they were stopping all flights. Um, and so we had to go home and we were one of maybe seven people on this flight back to St. Louis. And I got home and I was like, kind of ex- not excited. This is really weird. We like, didn't know a lot about COVID at the time. And so they're like, we're going to go on a lockdown. And I was like, I'm going to do these things where every month I'm going to have a holiday and we'll just spend this. <laughs> I just like got these ideas. Mm-hmm, yeah. How I was going to spend this time with my kids. You know, I don't, I didn't oh, know yeah. what we were doing. I started a garden. I, got, so. I, I had these <laughs> dreams. I was like, I was like, this month it will be Christmas. I was like, it will pull the elf, elf back out and all the things. <laughs> um, and, and I got home and um, I remember being like, um, I, I should get my period. That was weird. And I was like, uh, I should probably take a test before I have this big glass of wine. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it was COVID. I was like, oh my gosh. And, um, I did. And I was pregnant and I, uh, cried. I was scared. Um, I had already put this to, to bed. You know, I, I was not having any more children. And um, uh, I was hysterical. You know, I was like, we didn't know either what COVID could do to babies and pregnant people. Mm-hmm. And so um, that was not part of the plan. And I remember my mom even saying to me, like, um, just make sure you don't get pregnant. Like, because COVID could be like really hurt babies, you know, in utero. And, you know, we, we really didn't know. And um, I was like, holy shit, I'm pregnant. And um, it took quite a while for me to be like, okay, you know? And especially after everything with Leo, I was like, in terms of health, like, how is this all gonna go? Um, Kennedy, um, honestly, her Pregnancy was so boring because it was COVID. <laughs> we wiped down every piece of mail and we, 
<laughs> we, my husband couldn't go to any doctor's appointments, but honestly, I didn't care. I was like, if you watch the kids, like this is like a mini vacation. <laughs> yeah. I'll go to the doctor any day of the week. Like, this is great. And um, so basically, like everything went smoothly. Got to her birth. Um, it was a beautiful, amazing birth. I was induced. The Pitocin still didn't work. <laughs> they still tried. I was like, wow. why in the world are you giving me this medication? Like, it does not work. And they're like, we have to. I'm like, you really don't. <laughs> but, oh. <laughs> you guys, there wasn't a doula at this part point. So I didn't know my options. All right. Yeah. It's like, just do whatever you got to do. Um, and and it, this time, I was so interested. And I think my doula self was starting to come because I was like, I want, when you break my water, I want to see what it looks like, you know, and I want to feel her head and like, and I want to like, I wanted to be more involved. Um, and I was just like, I wanted to see my placenta. I wanted to, you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. everything was just like, um, amazing. By that point, I was more in tune to her, loved her. Like I knew, you know what I mean? Like I, at the beginning, it was very shocking, but by that point I was happy, um, that I was having her. And I will, I shit you not, girls, like, Kennedy is the light of, like, all of our lives. And, like, there is a reason why that happened, why I got pregnant. And she she has been that healing that we needed as a family. And and I don't know why, but um, she, she just, everything about her has just been, like, um, great. And so it's, like, she inspired me to then go on and be a postpartum doula mm. to help and start Survive and Thrive Mama, which I did when she was eight weeks old. And oh my God. I I started it when she was eight weeks. I felt pulled to do it. I was like, oh. this is the time. And women are at home feeling so alone. And I know how I felt with my first two. And um, I just knew that other women needed another voice, you know, and a real voice because we hear so much stuff, but we really don't hear. It's weird. We don't hear the truth. And like just someone telling us what to expect and what our truth could be. And even if it's not everybody's truth every time, because I'll tell you, my truth was much different when I had Leo than when I had Liv. Mm -hmm. But just knowing that that information is out there, I just really felt pulled to do it. And um, I and now she is three. And that, that's why it blows my mind is because yeah. this time has just like flown. Um, and having my babies, af- of all of that stuff that I just told you, positive, negative, scary, wonderful, it's all worth it. It's, at the end of the day, it's all worth it. Mm-hmm. These beautiful, amazing human beings that drive you crazy sometimes, but they are like just fabulous. It's just it's one of the best things you'll ever do, you know? Um, but it's also the hardest thing, one of the hardest things you'll ever do. And what I think all of us need are just people around us to hold hands with and be like, me too. I felt that way too. Because when somebody says that to you, all of a sudden, your your truth feels validated. And all we need is that validation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel yeah. like lighter, you know? Yeah. 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 You, I mean, absolutely. And um, one of the things that I love about this experience, number one, thank you for letting me just share all of that with you because it's just a lot of information, um, is that I started a um, support group for moms um, with babies ages four to six months, uh, mainly because I felt like the time zero to four months is um, a whirlwind. It is crazy. Um, <laughs> once you get a step out of that, um, people stop sending food. People stop checking in. And that four to six month mark is freaking hard. It is so hard. Yeah. And you feel really, you could feel really alone. And so we do these support groups with these women. And one of the first things we do is share our birth stories. And a lot of people say, I have never had anybody ask me, number one, to tell it, or number two, to write it down. And there's just really something so healing. So uh, you all inspire me so much just by by doing this and and asking people and inviting people to share. It's just really cool. 
Oh, thank you. That was really, really sweet. And yeah, that's like such a good time period to like have that support because you're right. I feel like you're really just running on adrenaline those first few months. And then you're kind of like slowing down and being like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. You're like, Things are coming up. up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Come fog. out of the fog. <laughs> They're like, oh, oh yeah, oh, I'm a person. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm a real. I'm a mother, but I'm a person. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, what, you know, I need. I need to to express how this feels too. And you can feel so alone when you're in your little like um, family unit with you know partner, partner, mm-hmm. kid. Um, you just feel like you're in this little bubble. I always kind of say like we're supposed to be in tribes we're supposed to have yeah. friends cousins moms you know sisters with you you know experiencing yeah. this all together like we shouldn't have to do this alone yeah um and so that's kind of the inspiration behind my business and um yeah i feel like you guys connect to that too yeah yeah um and people can find you for doula. Do you do doula support? Yeah. So I became certified as a postpartum doula. Everything that I do now is like virtual or it has been virtual because of course I started during COVID, Mm -hmm. but I have recently started going to people's homes, which has like brought me such joy. Yeah. Um, It is, it's amazing. What I found is that A lot of women need someone to bounce ideas off of and thoughts off of that they're going through in their everyday lives. And it's hard to call your doctor like 20 times a day, like calling your pediatrician. I don't know I did that. Mm -hmm. Um, But um, so people just need like that sister kind of support like, hey, my baby's doing this. Like, is that normal? Or do I have options when it comes to this, this and this? Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the postpartum doula in me um, kind of shines. The the support groups that I created are kind of like the the highlight of my postpartum or doula side. And then the sleep specialty side, I did that because nearly every mom that I talked to um, was talking about sleep. And it didn't really matter if it was sleep training or not. They just wanted their kids to sleep better mm-hmm. or a little bit longer. Or again, what are my options? Because even if you don't want to like technically sleep train your baby, there are so many really great ways to split up your nights with your partner Mm -hmm. in order for you to get like a good four hour chunk is Mm -hmm. what I always say. Like if you can get four hours of sleep at any time, like that's golden. Like that's what you really, really need. Um, But anyways, like I digress. I think that that's like my doula side and my sleep side all like kind of come together. And like, I just like to look at everything, yeah. not just the baby. And it's just not the baby's sleep. It's also the mother and what she's going through. And like, if you, mom's not getting any sleep and is like suffering, like, let's make that better. And let's call in partner. You know what I mean? Like, there's just so many things that we can do that a lot of first, first time moms especially um, don't do, which calling on their partner is one of them. You know, like making sure that other people are supporting them, all that fun stuff. Um, but anyways, yes, that's that's kind of what what I do. And I love it. It's so wonderful. And of course, the Instagram page is all all fun and a lot of information thrown at people. And it, it's just a lot of fun. I love it. So people yeah. can find you at on Instagram at survive and thrive mama on Instagram or survive and thrive mama.com um, on my website. Yeah. Perfect. Well, awesome. awesome. Yeah. yeah. If anybody needs that postpartum <laughs> or that sleep. Yeah. Everybody needs yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Everybody needs to sleep. <laughs> Everyone really does need to sleep. No, thank you so much for having me girls. I really appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. This was a delight. It was. Yeah. <laughs> we'll see you next episode. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. We hope you've enjoyed our discussion and found it insightful and beneficial. Remember, the Golden Hour Birth Podcast is made possible by the support of listeners like you. If you appreciate the content we bring you each week, consider leaving us a review on your favorite podcast platform or sharing the show with your friends and family. Your support helps us reach more people and continue creating valuable episodes. 
you have any questions, suggestions, or topics you'd like us to cover in future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us on our website, www.goldenhourbirthpodcast.com or connect with us on social media. We value your feedback and want to make sure that we're delivering the content you want to hear. Before we sign off, we'd like to express our gratitude to our incredible guests who joined us today. We are honored that they trust us enough to be so open and vulnerable. We're grateful for their time and willingness to share their stories with us. If you're interested in taking the conversation further with us, join us on our Facebook group, The Golden Hour Birth Circle. We'll be back next week with another exciting episode, so be sure to tune in. Until then, stay golden and remember to take care of yourself. We'll catch you on the next episode of the Golden Hour Birth Podcast. Bye!